Hi, my name is Rick McCallum from the Graduate School of Education at the University of California, Berkeley, where I'm the director of the Masters in Reading program and train reading specialists. In this brief e-seminar today, I'm going to try to explain the basic issues that are involved in literacy assessment with a focus on learning to read and assessment in reading. Now to do that, I'm going to have to set up some, ba some basic background issues and ask a set of uh, basic questions that we'll need to answer. So let's start with the simple and the most important, and that is, what is the goal of literacy assessment or reading assessment? Stated simply, the goal in all assessment is to identify patterns in student behavior, in this case, in their behaviors that are associated with learning to read. Now, although it may not seem this way to uh, parents and to others, kids are rule-governed. And by that mean their behavior follows a set of rules as they come to understand and explore and, and to understand more fully the process, processes associated with learning to read. I know it seems chaotic sometimes what kids are doing, that it doesn't seem to follow any pattern, but it isn't quite true that that's the case. If we look closely at what students are doing, we can identify the patterns in their behavior and then make adjustments accordingly. And that's what literacy assessment is about, identifying patterns in students' behavior and then using that information to make effective decisions for instruction. So let's take that the next step and talk a little bit about assessment and how it operates in our larger instructional um, setting. The important point here is that assessment, as designated by this A, it's not a separate entity that operates alone and apart from other, other aspects of, of the reading process, particularly in learning to read. There's what we might call instruction, and there's a relationship between an assessment and instruction, and it's one that I call an assessment instruction cycle. Assessment helps us understand patterns in students' behavior so that we can use that information as we design instruction that will be suited towards individual student needs. Uh, or in the case of individual one-on-one -on -one tutorial or in the case of a classroom, the, cl the needs of a larger group of students, small group or whole group of students. This assessment and instruction cycle is ideally we'll work towards. We'll use assessment information to identify patterns. We'll then take that information and use it to make decisions about instruction. Then as we collect additional assessment information, we'll modify and adapt our instruction to meet the needs of students. And, and we know how that is. When we're working with someone and, and, and some activity doesn't seem to be connecting, we want to modify that or adapt it in a way that will work for students. So there's a cycle that operates. Now, let's talk a little bit about the cycle, how it works, and about assessments uh, particularly. The first thing we need to do is we need to add a component to this little model, and that might be designated by the outside box. And this box represents the fact that we don't make decisions around assessment and ins instruction outside of a broader context of some understanding of what's going on with the reading process. In fact, we make those decisions now in light of what are called currently called standards. Now, what are these standards and how do they operate in relation to the assessment instruction cycle? Standards simply defined are those behaviors that we'd like students to embody or to show at the end of our instruction. That is, standards are what we want students to be able to do at the end of instruction. Now, this is the comp this is the current term for these, uh, these objectives. Um, they've been called other things. They've been called benchmarks. They've been called grade level expectations. There are a variety of terms for this notion of standards, but it reflects our goals, our instructional goals. What is it that we want our kids to be able to do? And then assessment and instruction cycle operates within that larger context. And it's, it's important because when we, ask, we talk about assessment, the first question we ask is, assess what? That is, 
which of the standards or behaviors are we going to be focusing on when we look at, when we collect assessment information. And that's very, very important. This, these standards, in effect, represent our model of the reading process. And we'll talk another time about, we'll talk another time about models and how that operates, but our, for the point for the discussion here is that our assessment instruction decisions are made in light of a broader set of standards which reflect our models of reading. That is what we want kids to be able to do um, at the end of our instruction. So we'll come back to that. But let's take up now the notion of assessment and elaborate on that um, for a minute. Over here on assessment, there's many ways to distinguish and describe assessment in literacy, but let me make a simple distinction. The first distinction about assessment is what we might call, or the first type, is what we might call diagnostic assessment. And I'll talk about that in a second. The second type is what I'll refer to as ongoing assessment. And these both refer to the points at which points at which during this instructional cycle we collect information. So let's start here, diagnostic. This is the question of the, of the chicken and the egg. Where do we start first? Do we start in this cycle? Do we start with assessment first or do we start with instruction first? Well, as a reading specialist, what we do is we st always start from a diagnostic perspective. That is, what information can we collect about a student that will help us understand the patterns in their behavior as they're working to develop a, an adult model of reading. So we want to know how students are approaching the process and how they're operating with it and specific types of patterns that are operating in their behavior. And that's where we start. It's, it, it's related to um, what you might think of as a medical model. We have the same kind of diagnostic orientation. We want to get a sense of, at least at one point in time, how are our students approaching the task, what kinds of skills and abilities and strategies do they have, and what are the nature of the patterns that operate there. Now, diagnostic information is important, but it doesn't, it doesn't end there. So we get our diagnostic information, we can make some initial decisions about instruction, and then we implement those. We implement them, and as we're implementing them, we're collecting additional information about what students can do. That is the information related to how they adapted or dealt with the instruction. That's called ongoing assessment, and it's very important for a variety of reasons. One, because at the, with diagnostic assessment, we're only beginning to get a sense of what students can do. As we talked about before in another uh, e-seminar, Reading is a complex set of behaviors, and it's going to take us some time to get a sense of what students are able to do and how they're operating and approaching the reading, reading task. So it's a starting point. We may, make, we may get it right, we may not. We may have to adjust and adapt as we get more information about what students are able to do. Dr. McCollum, can you comment on where state standardized testing of reading fits into this model? Sure. Just as we're making this distinction between diagnostic and ongoing um, assessment for the purposes of instruction in reading, there are a variety of purposes and, and uh, needs and goals associated with assessment. Um, there's assessment at the classroom level there for specific instruction that teachers are engaged in. There's assessment at the, at the uh, specialist level, like I'm talking about. There's assessment at the school-wide level for accountability. There's assessment at the state level. The kind of assessment I'm talking about here is assessment designed to facilitate instruction. Other types of assessment, large-scale standardized measures, our statewide, in California, our statewide assessment measures, are designed for accountability purposes. Although a teacher might be able to take and glean diagnostic information from those tests, they're not necessarily designed for those purposes. They're designed for other larger scale accountability purposes for the needs of the legislature. So it's a good question and it's one that's important to give us a sense of what we're talking about here because 
for me, as a reading specialist, we're talking about instruction design specifically for um, it's assessment, excuse me, designed specifically for um, instructional purposes and um, hence the ongoing types of assessment we're talking about here. So this is important to see. These are the basic, con basic constructs associated with assessment as we talk about the assessment instruction cycle, how that operates within a context of a stand set of standards or a model of reading, and then how assessment uh, includes both diagnostic and ongoing um, components. Now let me go a little bit further and talk a little bit about other principles, basic principles that operate and that are implicit in the assessment and instruction cycle and in the designation between diagnostic and ongoing. All right? Now as I said before, as I said in another and discussed in another, in another e-seminar, uh, reading is a complex process. It involves sociocultural, uh, psychological, developmental, and physiological components. So it's important that as we look at a complex process, we have a set of assessment tools that will allow us to try to deal with some of that complexity. So one of the things we, it's important that we need to do is we need to use multiple measures. By that I mean we need to look at this process um, at, from multiple perspectives and collect information that will allow us to get us insight into students' um, patterns of behavior. So for example, we can't simply look at reading at one point in time and then say we know what the patterns are in students' behavior. We have to look at um, ops, we have to collect information from multiple sources and we have to do, we have to look across time. We have to look at from point A to point B to point C, and that's the developmental component. That is, we want to look at the similarities and the, the patterns in students' behavior as they operate over time through our instructional cycle or at different points in our assessment cycle. So we need to think about those um, uh, processes as they change over time to get insights into how students are approaching the task. The third issue is we want to keep a focus on process, not products. Now this is a little bit harder one and then it take a minute to, to, to think about this. As we think about reading and what's going on in the process of reading, we want to talk about the patterns in, that students are operating, the patterns are operating in student behavior and the rules that are operating behind that so that we can identify ways that we can uh, move students along to being better readers. Now, with testing, we have the, both the, I, an opportunity to look at the process that students are engaged in, but we also have at the end a product, that is a score, a stay nine, a percentile rank, some kind of tangible measure. We have to keep that in check, our focus on the product, uh, because when we do focus on the product where someone scored percentile wise and so on, we may lose our perspective on what's really important and that is the process. Um, and when you work with kids over time, you'll see that the product will vary and that they may go up and they may go down and they may change a little bit, but most of the time the process will remain the same. So we have to keep our eye on the prize, that is looking at what's going on in the reading process rather than being too consumed about um, the number of percentage that they words they read correctly, how many words per minute they read. Those are important, but those are not the, the major issue of what we're about, which is how students are uh, approaching the, uh, the, the reading process. So, Dr. McCollum, let me see if I got this right. So, in other words, a possible process could be taking a look at a measure within a student, saying that it's a particular student is having a hard time uh, maybe with their vocabulary or maybe with their comprehension or perhaps with something... Um, recognizing certain common words. Is that uh, what you mean by process? That, absolutely. Those are component processes important for students to make progress in reading. Well, that, and I would want to focus our attention, and I, we do with our students in, in literacy training, to focus our attention on what, on what processes students are using 
still with an eye on how are they doing relative to others, to, uh, relative to other students at their grade level, relative to a set criterion that, of performance that we might set. So we want to keep, we want to collect information, and we'll we will have products, but we want to keep our um, focus in the way in a, on the part that's most important for us instructionally, and that's the process. Now, how do you do that? You say, well, what's the process? Well, when in the focus on process. We're looking for patterns in what in in the errors that students make, or what have also been called miscues. That is, where they're trying to um, approach the process, the the reading process effectively, but they fall short. And and this is a pro an aspect of assessment that that's um, interesting, I think, and and important. And that is that the most information in assessment doesn't come from the questions that students answer correctly, but rather from their attempts or their approximations, their guesses, their errors that they make as they try to uh, approach the tasks that we ask them to engage in. And now we're talking about different types of measures in assessment and how different measures provide us with different kinds of information. Now, you, it seems a bit counterintuitive, but it's but it's actually true because once a student gets an answer correct, that is chooses the correct response, we really cannot say much about the process that went into them deciding upon that response. Did they guess it? Um, were they using the strategies and, and techniques that we had taught them? Well, we just really don't know. But on the other hand, when students fall a bit short and make approximations that fall not within the range of what we might consider a correct response, we can look at those attempts and see qualitatively how they were approaching the reading task. And when we look across time and with multiple measures, you know what falls out? A profile falls out. So that if a student's having an error, a problem with, say, vowels or vowel patterns or with certain endings or in certain situations, it'll show up. It'll show up in across the different measures that we're engaged in, and it'll show up again and again across time, if we're attentive to and are looking for those kinds of process-oriented um, miscues or errors in students' behavior. So we need to focus on process. Another important point is that instructional activities provide critical assessment information, and we saw that in the in the larger. Um, assessment instruction cycle. That is the notion of ongoing assessment. So that depending on the nature of the instructional activities we employ, that those activities and how students respond to them, their patterns of errors and approximations, their correct responses, all of that provides us with additional and very important assessment information so that we can see if the um, hypotheses that we set out from our diagnostic assessment were in, in, in fact true and that what we were what the dis instruction that we designed was appropriate and and necessary for that student if not we want to change it if it's working keep it going if not we may to need to make adjustments and adaptations to get mo students moving along particularly students who have are having difficulty learning to read or uh, have fallen behind their uh, class or peers. Okay? The last is an, a very important point, and that has to do with interpreting assessment data in light of what we know about the whole child. Now, this is important because we have to do, uh, we have to, just as we talked about with focusing on the process, not the product, we have to keep our um, our perspective on what's important, and that's the whole child. And we have to avoid um, a tendency or an inclination to make to fragment or to split apart the process, the reading process particularly, and how that operates inside the uh, the, the life of the and the broader um, components of the reading process and of the broader issues associated with learning to read. Let me let me explain. As I said. In a prior seminar, there are social cultural issues associated with learning to read. That is, children come from cultural backgrounds and bring understandings about literacy. 
We have to un interpret what we know and collect from specific measures in light of what we know about the whole child's experience. From a psychological perspective, psychological issues involve not only cognitive, that is memory and learning, cognitive types of issues, but affective, our emotional types of issues. Those are very, very important, especially for students who are struggling to learn to read. Their understandings of their own reading abilities, their self-concept and their esteem and so forth are very, very important variables in learning to read. We can't lose our perspective on the larger whole child when we're looking at specific nuts and bolts types of issues. So this is again a, um, a reminder of that this is a process that operates within the whole child and we need to keep that, keep that in mind. And there's impo some, a couple of important things in there that need to be mentioned. And one is that kids are unique and they do not, they're all different and they all follow different patterns and manifest these many variables in different ways. And it's one of the mysteries of life and one of the wonders of teaching to, to know that um, they're all different and they don't, we need to view them that way and view them within their, the whole larger context of who they are and where they are in their lives, and that's very important in, in assessment. Well, we've covered a lot. Let's just take a minute, wrap up, and talk a little bit about the importance of assessment um, from my perspective. From my perspective, assessment is a critical component of teaching and learning to read. The quality of the assessment and the type of assessment that's utilized by teachers, uh, reading specialists, and others who are involved in the reading and teaching kids to learn to read provide a great insight into, one, their models of, of learning to read and their views of kids and how reading operates in the larger lives of kids. So, a couple of tips for you. As you're looking at measures, um, ask yourself some, some, some simple questions. What kind of diagnostic information do these measures provide? Um, do they provide me information about my specific child and how they're learning to, learning to read and approaching the reading process? Do they help to identify the patterns that are operating in your child's uh, reading behavior? You may also want to ask about the nature of the reading model. That is, what and how these how these assessment tools relate to a broader understanding of how kids learn to read. Now, of course, um, the larger question is to ask and to look at how assessment links directly to instruction. Ideal, in the ideal world, our assessment and our instruction in the, in the assessment instruction cycle are aligned or, or tied together in such a way that they feed directly upon each other. That is, assessment provides information directly linked to instruction and then as instruction takes place ongoing assessment is used to adjust and modify the instruction. So take a look at the instruction and, and think about it relative to the types of assessments that are utilized and you can ask yourself if you think they are aligned and ask teachers and others um, these very same questions. So well, I hope you have a better a bit of a better sense of how literacy assessment operates and we'll talk more at a later date. Thank you, Dr. McCollum.